grace and peace to you on this Ascension Day. Our first Ascension reading is from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 16, verses 14 through 20. We hear these words of the Gospel in Jesus' name. Later he appeared to the eleven themselves, as they were reclining at the table. He rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new languages, they will pick up snakes, and if they drink any deadly poison it will not harm them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will get well. Then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Those who went out preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. This is the word of the Lord. Your brothers and sisters in Jesus, have you ever wondered what it would be like to know someone influential? For example, what would it be like if you had a friend who was a drummer for a famous band? Do you think that perhaps this friend could get you backstage passes or access to a private session with the band? Or what would it be like to have a cousin who was a successful travel agent? Do you think that she could help you plan the perfect vacation, find the, the best deals and the best time of year to travel to an exciting place? Or what would it be like to be running buddies with the mayor? Do you think that perhaps you could have input on policy every time you met to go for a run? What would it be like to know someone influential? Well, dear friends, whether or not you have connections to a drummer or a travel agent or a mayor, you know someone far more influential than all of them. Better than that, someone more influential than all of them knows you. You see, the one who is sitting on the throne, the one who is ruling over all heaven and all earth, is your brother, your human brother, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus, the Son of God and the Son of Mary, is the exalted King, ruling over all creation. And this is what the Bible means when it says that Jesus sat down at the right hand of God. You see, the right hand of God isn't referring to some geographical location as if you could hop in a rocket ship and travel to a faraway planet and, and find the throne of God and there at the right side would be Jesus. No. The right hand of God isn't referring to a geographical location. The right hand of God is everywhere. The right hand of God means God's omnipotent, all-powerful rule over heaven and earth. And this omnipotent rule over heaven and earth is being exercised by your brother, your human brother, Jesus. Now this ascension of Jesus into heaven and this rule of Jesus over all creation means some very comforting things for us. It means, first of all, that there is absolutely no doubt that your sins have all been forgiven and that God will certainly receive you into heaven for Jesus' sake. Remember that the Savior descended from heaven not just to die for the small sins, 
but to die for all of them, the vilest and darkest sins included. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He took away all your sins. He humbled himself to the lowest place, taking responsibility for all the crimes of mankind as if he had done them, getting the punishment for those sins. Now he's not suffering anymore. He who humbled himself to the lowest place of all has been exalted to the highest place of all. He's been received into heaven. He's been seated in a place of glory. And if your Savior, who took away your sins, has been taken into heaven, you will certainly be welcomed there as well. If the one who took responsibility for your crimes has been exalted, you will be exalted too. Now there's another very comforting thing that Jesus' ascension means for us because as he sits on that throne of heaven and earth, and as he rules over all things, he rules for us. He rules for the benefit of his church, his people who trust in him. And he rules over all things knowing what it's like here. Knowing what it's like here, not just because he sees the earth, but because he has lived here himself. He blesses the work of his church. He is with his church, and he works with us as we carry out that important work of sharing his gospel with others. In the first generation of his church, Jesus validated the preaching of the apostles with signs and with wonders. And as we continue preaching the same message they did, Jesus blesses our work. He brings about that great miracle of converting hearts from damning unbelief to saving faith. And he uses those very simple tools to do so. He uses his gospel as it's preached. And he uses his word joined to water in holy baptism. And he adds souls to his kingdom to be under his rule and to live and reign with him forever. This is his powerful, gracious, and continuing work. The work of the one who sits on the throne, the one whom you know, the one who knows you, your Savior and your brother, Jesus. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, grant us faith to know you as our risen and ascended Lord, ruling all things. Grant us joy in your glorious exaltation, and the glorious exaltation you will grant to us one day. Grant us faithfulness to continue sharing and supporting the gospel as it extends to all creation, where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. Amen. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name given to mankind by which we must be saved. Amen. The text for this devotion is recorded for us today. In the book of Psalm, chapter 68, verses 18 through 20, we hear these words. You ascended on high, you led captivity captive. You received gifts among men, so that even among the rebellious the Lord God might dwell. And blessed be the Lord, day by day, he bears our burdens. He is the God who saves us. Our God is the God who saves, and from God the Lord comes escape from death. God's word is truth. Amen. Never again. Never again will a tomb hold a dead Jesus. Never again will, the cro will a cross hold the author of life. Never again will a spear 
pierce him through who is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Never again will his blood be spilt to pay for your sin and for mine. It only happened once, and it was on purpose. And what that purpose was, is for Jesus Christ to conquer our biggest fears, the fear of sin, of death, and the accuser named Satan. The one who wishes to accuse us of every sin, even confessed and forgiven sins, the one who desires to hold us captive by fear. Jesus came to conquer that, all of that. And now, our risen Lord, he ascends into heaven from where he rules all things. And in our text today, and from what we have heard about in the other accounts, what we see is this Jesus Christ, victorious, he has defeated and bound in chains all the enemies of our souls. And they are held captive. And they can torment you no longer. Do you believe this to be true? I pray so. That is certainly my prayer for you, for everyone who is listening right now, to know that Jesus has conquered our biggest fears and really every fear. He has conquered all the enemies of our souls. But the truth of the matter is, right, there are phantoms of fears that, that swim around in our mind that still haunt us. Today, let us confront the phantom of our fears with the message of Jesus Christ and who he is and what he has done. Because you see those phantoms of past fears, they still want to control you. They still want nothing more than to lead you by fear. But and what does that even look like? For Sam, he was a man of, of vigilante justice. Hurt a man tremendously. To, in his sense, create a, a sense of justice in his own mind. But now he sees that, that, no, justice was not in his hands. Could not be. Now he wonders, is there really forgiveness from God for, for what he has done? Another man was ruled by greed and jealousy. Can God forgive him? A woman drives by Planned Parenthood and remembers what took place long ago. Has God really and truly forgiven her for that sin? For what happened so long ago? Another man has cleared his search history on his computer and even though he has done that, he wonders, has Jesus cleared him of his sins? The fear of death almost seems as if it's a noose around Tim's neck. He's terrified by death. Can he truly and really live free from this terror of death? My friends, see your biggest fears. See all of your fears. Call them out by name. From small to great. Do not miss one of them. See Jesus. See Jesus as the one who leads those fears captive, bound, defeated. See Jesus as the victorious one. And who takes all of your fears and all of our sins and the terror of them and puts them in their place defeated. They can hold on to you no longer. So now what we see in Psalm 68 it says, Day by day he bears our burdens. Day by day God provides for us for our daily needs. Day by day 
He forgives us of our sins and reminds us of that forgiveness so that you and I, so that we can have this vibrant faith that desires to live as a child of God, vibrant and free, willing and able to face whatever comes next. You see, day by day, Jesus, he gives us peace of mind through his word. Our God is a God who saves. And he dwells among us. We hear those words that he dwells among us, the rebellious ones. Although God, Jesus Christ, although he is in heaven, he too rules here. He is with us, rebellious sinners though we are. And he is the one who has wiped us clean of sin. He is the one who not only calls us holy, but he is the one who makes us holy. Jesus saves. And therefore, brothers and sisters in Christ, let us bring praise to Jesus Christ, our risen and ascended Lord, for all our days. Bring praise to his holy name. Amen. Let us now continue with prayer. Jesus Christ, draw out of us every fear great and small, and let us call it by name and recognize that you are the one who has conquered, defeated them, who holds our fears captives. You hold them captive, and never again can they torment us. Never again will we see them conquer us, because, Lord, you have conquered them, and we are child, uh, uh, child of God, children of you, and, and we live and dwell with you eternally. Day by day, we bring our burdens to you. Day by day, hear our prayer. Day by day, you are the Lord who promises to be with us now and into eternity. And day by day, let us bring praise to your holy name. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our devotion lesson is Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17 through 20. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Grace and peace to you from God, and our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Anyone who has been in a boat understands the purpose of an anchor. And yet, if you've never set foot in a boat, you still get the picture, don't you? You know that an anchor provides safety and security, protection from a storm. The writer to the Hebrews uses that same picture, the same picture of an anchor in a very symbolic way. Some of the things that anchor provides are the same, protection and safety, but to those, we add one more, hope. The writer to the Hebrews says that our anchor is an anchor of hope because our anchor is our Savior, Jesus. Today, let's briefly analyze, look at this text, analyzing three reasons why Jesus is the anchor of hope for our souls. First, we are told that God made an oath in addition to the promises that he made. In the Old Testament times, every matter needed to be established by the testimony of at least two witnesses. And so God had made a promise to Abraham and to the other Old Testament believers, but he was his own witness. And so to that promise, God added an oath. He swore an oath to Abraham that he would do everything that he had promised. 
And so God gave two witnesses, his promise and his oath, to provide security and confidence to Abraham and to give us security and confidence as well. Reason number one, that Jesus is our anchor of hope for the soul, is because we have God's promise and oath fulfilled in Jesus. Secondly, we could say God really only needed to have one promise. He only needed to speak his word once because God simply cannot lie. That's what the writer to the Hebrews said. Moses spoke the same truth in Numbers chapter 23 when he recorded these words. God is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? In other words, every promise God has made in, is yes in Christ. There is not a single promise that God has made that will go unfulfilled. It's difficult for us to grasp, isn't it? We are people who have lived in a world where we have been disappointed by others who have not lived up to their words. And sad to say, we have to admit that we are not always people of our word either, are we? And so we recognize the effects of sin in our life. Our words sometimes are not the truth but not God. Every statement that God has made, every promise that he has given will happen exactly as he said. And so when we think about God's promise that our sins are forgiven and that we have eternal salvation in Jesus, it's already fulfilled. When God promises that he is never going to leave us, that he's going to guide us and keep us safe all the way to our eternity, that's a promise that God will fulfill. Jesus is the anchor of hope for our soul because God cannot lie. Finally, we see that Jesus is the anchor of hope for our soul because he ascended into heaven. The writer to the Hebrews once again uses the picture of Jesus behind the curtain, a reference to Jesus entering the most holy place behind that curtain of the temple that separated the place where God was from the rest of the temple. Jesus, the writer says, is our forerunner. He has gone to heaven before us. And we know that he's coming back. The same Jesus who went before us into heaven will come back in the same way we have seen him go. And as our ascended Lord, he's prepared a place for us, reservations in our name with him in heaven. The same Jesus who came once is coming back. He's coming back to take us to be with him so that we also may be where he is. Yes, Jesus is an anchor of hope for our souls because he rules all things from his ascended throne in heaven and, is, will, and will return to take us to be with him. We have an anchor of hope for our souls. So no matter what happens, no matter what storms come in this life, we have protection we have safety, we have salvation, and it's all centered in one source, our Savior Jesus, who came to this world, who lived in our place, who died for us, who rose again and ascended into heaven to guarantee that we will be with him forever. Cherish the anchor of hope for the soul. Know that you can stand confident and firm no matter what comes, because your Lord stands with you. And his anchor will hold us fast. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you are the anchor of hope for our souls as our ascended Lord. When the storms of life shake us, lead us to stand firm and solid in your love. Remind us that all of the promises you have made to us have been or will be fulfilled and that you are coming back to take us to live with you forever in eternity. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts 1, verses 6 through 11. So when they were together, they asked, Lord, is this the time when you are going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, 
and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said these things, he was taken up while they were watching, and a cloud took him out of their sight. They were looking intently into the sky as he went away. Suddenly two men in white clothes stood beside them. They said, Men of Galilee, why are you standing here looking up into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. There's always been an almost counterintuitive link between Jesus' ascension and evangelism. At first, it might seem a detriment to the growth of God's kingdom that Jesus has, has physically left the earth. But in reality, Jesus' ascension was the spark that lit the fuse of the powder keg we call Pentecost, where by the power of the Holy Spirit, over 3,000 people came to faith in a single day. And Jesus, both in, in Matthew's Gospel and here in Acts, clearly links his ascension to evangelism as he gives us the Great Commission to go make disciples of all nations. And here, in, in, as Luke records, he says, You will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Celebrating Jesus' ascension should give every believer confidence to be bold witnesses for Christ in this world. And yet confidence is, is often hard to come by because we are so unsure of ourselves and so uncertain of the future. Case in point, 11 ordinary men in the vicinity of Bethany who stood with their chins tilted towards the sky, staring into heaven after Jesus had ascended. I very much doubt that Jesus' disciples were filled with confidence in this moment. Jesus had just said some incredibly profound things to them. And before they could even process, before they could even ask a single question, Jesus was taken up into heaven before their very eyes until a cloud hid him from their sight. And they are left simply wondering and staring into the sky. No doubt they, they would have liked to question their master for hours as they been able to do for three remarkable years during his earthly ministry, but not this time. I imagine that they were unsure of, their self, of themselves and uncertain of the future. Who were, were they to start the revolution that would be the Christian church? How could they go on without Jesus' direct leadership? And what was going to happen? Would, would they be put to death? Would, would the Jewish leaders take them away and imprison them? It's no wonder they're standing there staring into the sky. I feel like one of those disciples sometimes, don't you? I know that Jesus has called me to be his witness, but I'm unsure of myself and I'm uncertain of the future. Who am I to sh share the word of, of God with others? I wish I knew more of the scriptures. I can't even order at a restaurant without mixing up my words. How am I supposed to talk about what's most important? Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. How can I actually expect my testimony of Jesus' love to be powerful for someone else to hear who doesn't believe in him? And, and what's going to happen in the future? How are we supposed to share our faith in this time of pandemic and quarantine? How are our churches supposed to grow? How is God's kingdom supposed to thrive when we don't even know what's going to happen in the next month, much less the next year? And when these questions rise, we are filled with a sort of paralysis, and we too are left staring at the sky, wishing that Jesus would come back and explain everything to us. And unfortunately, because of our, our fear, our, our doubt, our paralysis in evangelism, we end up keeping our faith to ourselves and we, we hunker down. My friends, when you feel frozen, I want you to remember the words of the angels. They say, men of Galilee, people of the, the Madison area, why are you standing here looking up into the sky? 
Jesus is going to come back in the same way that he was taken up to heaven. And my friends, that is the exact thing we need to hear because it tells us that we, we may not be sure of ourselves, but we can be certain that our witness will have power. And it also tells us that we can know the future. Right? Maybe you are unsure of yourself when it comes to witnessing for Christ. And you know what? That's logical. If you were confident that you yourself could convince someone else of a spiritual truth that is only understood by faith, you would be crazy. But the angel said that, that Jesus has gone into heaven. In other words, Jesus' power is, is no longer hidden on earth, but it is magnified at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. And from that throne, he has sent us his Holy Spirit. So in other words, it doesn't depend on us when we witness. And we're just the witness on the stand. The Holy Spirit is the lawyer who will take our testimony and, and convince the jury. We just need to witness. And, and, and through God's word, through the good news of Jesus Christ, what he has done for us, the Holy Spirit will accomplish what he wants to accomplish through our testimony. So don't be... You can be unsure of yourself, but don't be unsure of the Holy Spirit and the power of your own testimony because your Savior has ascended. And we can also know the future right? because the angel remind us that the same Jesus is going to return on the clouds one day. A lot of our life is unsure. The future it is impossible to see here on earth and, and it never goes as, as we would expect. But ultimately, we know that unless it's Jesus on the clouds, it isn't the end of the world. Whatever you're going through right now, this, this isn't how it ends. Ultimately, Jesus is going to come back and he's going to pick up what he purchased. Blood-bought children of God will be, will be pulled up with him into eternal glory forever and ever. That's your future. And that's the future for, for all who believe in Jesus through the Holy Spirit. My friends, why are you standing here looking up into the sky? As if you're just waiting for the clouds to part, waiting for the moment to be just right. Evangelism is hard. Sharing our faith is difficult. And, and it will never just be perfect. It will never be just right. It's always going to be a bit cloudy on this side of heaven. But it doesn't depend on you. It is the Spirit's power that will bring people to faith. And your Savior reigns with power and authority, and He is going to come and bring all His beloved together with Him to heaven someday. So there is a, a confidence and an urgency that is given to us by God through His Word today. Jesus said, you will be my witnesses. He didn't say, you might be, or some of you are good enough to be my witnesses. Some of you, no, not so much. He said, you will be my witnesses, and our Savior only speaks the truth. Be bold witnesses for your Savior. What are you waiting for? Amen. Amen.